Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We're a small church here in North Middletown, uh, New Jersey, and we just wanted to uh, speak the Word of God to you folks that are uh, kind of home, thinking about the most important things in life and uh, having some reflection because you're not able to be out and about. It seems like it's been, uh, it has been months that people have been locked down in their homes, myself included, <clears throat> just trying to keep away. So uh, in, in thought of the folks that might be concerned or worried, um, well, let's just pray. Father, you tell us that we should bring all things to you, and we bring this to you, this time where people are in fear and people are in want. And I pray, Lord, that you would be gracious to us, that you would strengthen us, Help us to look to you in all these things, that you would comfort our hearts, Lord, those who are afraid and concerned. I pray that you would show them your strength, that you might encourage their hearts. And Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that you would help us to understand you more. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're in 1 John, the book of 1 John, we're in chapter 2, we're going to take the middle portion, which basically is three small verses from 15 to 17. Uh, they're, they're such deep and wide verses, I figured we would just concentrate on those instead of any more, and so uh, that's why we just have three. I, I've titled this Bad Love, because there, there is a good love and there is a bad love, as much as everybody talks about love and how important it is, and uh, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, and, and all of that and what it means. Um, w there is a bad love, and the scripture talks about a love that God hates. And so it's important that we look at it. So just to remind us of what real love looks like, agape love, which is the kind of love that God has for us, which is unconditional and complete dedication to our good. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 4 to 8, it says that love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And above all, we know that love never fails. This is real love that God explains to us in 1 Corinthians and what that looks like. And all the, although we can have all the gifts and we can be intelligent, strong, and resourceful, all of these other things, if you don't have love, it means nothing at all. And uh, 1 Corinthians bears that out. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what real love looks like and about the kind of love that we tend to be prone to because of the, where we live. Uh, just to go over some of the things that First John has been talking about, he's been speaking to us about how we have fellowship with him and how we recognize that we have fellowship with him. What does that look like for a Christian, for someone who has a relationship with God, who has dedicated their life to him through Jesus Christ? How does that exhibit itself in the way that you live? He says here in verses 5 to 7 in chapter 1, what we do is we walk in the light. We practice the truth. We have fellowship uh, with one another, with God, and our sins are continually washed from us. That is the experience of somebody who is a Christian, who's walking with God, and, and somebody has a relationship with God. Uh, verse 8 and 9 of chapter 1, we possess the truth by confessing our sin. You see, we say we're sinners. We're, none of us is perfect. And we receive absolution, forgiveness, and perpetual cleansing. So part of what it is to be a Christian is always to know the state of our soul, that we're far from God, that we're broken. We were born that way, and we'll always be that way until we go to see him face to face. Uh, but we're always in the process of being perfected. Uh, verse 10 in chapter 1 says, We confess to being born in sin and marred by sin. So not only are we still contaminated and still fall, but in the original state, we, we have sinned and we've done all kinds of things. We've got a whole list of things. You can't say you're a good person and have a list like that. And that's all of us. We have a rap sheet. In chapter 2, it says that we have an advocate and a propitiation for our failures. So we understand that our failures are going to be part of our lives, but we have somebody who has taken our place, taken the heat, taken the punishment, the eternal punishment that we've deserved and earned by our sins, that Jesus Christ has come and been the provision. He's been the substitute for our sins. And we confess that openly. 
something else, chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, we do those things that he tells us to do. One of those things about somebody who confesses to have a relationship with God is they do those things that are written in the scriptures that are disclosed to us to do. And if, you're, if you say that you're a Christian and you don't do what God says, you're a liar. That's what the scripture says. And verse, chapter 2, verse 7 to 11, it says that we live by the law of love as Jesus has shown us. We love one another, and especially those that know him. It's easier, certainly easier to love people that love you back. But we show love for one another, and we show love for God. Love for God by obeying his commandments, and love for one another by thinking more of the needs of others than we do of ourselves, and thinking in addition to our own needs, the needs of others. So this is what we've learned previously. Today we're going to tackle this verse from 15 to 17. John says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world for if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of god abides forever very deep passage, hugely pivotal. Pivotal. I want to read it in a couple of other versions for you so that you get the sense of what it's saying. In the, in the New Living Translation, it says here, Do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does and pleases God will live forever. Here's uh, the, the Living Bible says it this way. Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love these things, you show that you do not really love God. For all these worldly things, these evil desires, the crave for sex and the ambition to to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance, these are not from God. They are from this evil world itself. And this world is fading away, and these evil forbidden things will go with it. But whoever does the will of God will live forever. So it's a bit more of an expanded version, so it gives you some ideas of uh, actually some of the text and what it says in the original language. So let's pick it up from verse 15. It says, do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, it's important to see exactly what it says, but also what it doesn't say. Some of the original language uh, studies will reveal some things beneath the surface. Like when it says, do not love the world, it actually means stop loving the world. So after John is explaining, this is how you know that somebody has fellowship with God or you know that you have fellowship with God. He goes into this thing where he has a little poetic thing. I write to you fathers. I write to you children. I, I write to you little children. I, I write to you young men. He's, he's writing to those who are Christians, and he establishes that very solid. You guys have a relationship with God. And the very next thing he says is stop loving the world. Stop loving the world. So it's not just... Uh, don't do this thing, and I'm sure you've never done this. It's you guys do this, and a tendency for all of us to do that. So it says stop loving the world, which means we have a problem because we have a tendency to, to fall in love with the things in this world. And that affection separates us from the love of God. So it, it states very clearly that it's, it's a problem. Love, the word for love is agape. It means to completely be given over, totally dedicated, to be selfless in the way that you love this particular thing. That's the kind of love that God has for us, and it's the kind of love that we bestow upon things and stuff and titles and degrees and all sorts of things. And we value those and we love those. I mean, we will do almost anything. And we'll get into a bit more of what it is. But it's to take pleasure in a thing, to prize it above other things, to be unwilling to abandon it or to do without it. There should be nothing in our lives that has that sort of a grip on us. We call it addiction. But we can become addicted to shopping and food and so many other things. 
So do not love the world. Stop loving the world. Stop being completely dedicated to the place where you can't let this stuff go. And the world. Well, you, you say, well, don't love the world. In John 3.16, it says, God so loved the world. By the way, it's the same word. It's cosmos. God so loved the world. Well, he tells us not to love the world, but he loves the world. It's a different kind of world, uh, just like the wide world of sports or the world of music or whatever world it is. He's talking about the human beings of the world. He's not talking about the sphere itself. He's talking about the people of the world. When this uses the term world, this world system that appeals to the visceral appetites of the human body and the soul, those things in this world which would seek to fill your life with some temporary sense of importance or satisfaction that never do. Any of you who bought a new car know what that's like. I, I don't have a new car. I've never gotten a new car. Uh, but I understand if you get a new car, it's beautiful, shiny, smells good, that nice new car smell. Uh, you can actually get a, a, a nice little Christmas tree that smells that way and put it in your car. But having something new and then watching it fade away is, is such a terrible thing. You think, I finally have this thing. I've saved money or I put money aside or I figured out how I'm going to afford it. And you get the thing and guess what? It doesn't fill you or you, you have a relationship, or you get a new thing. Any of that only has a temporary excitement, and then you're left empty, wanting to fill that empty space again. That's the stuff of this world that is a substitute for the love of God. It's opposed to the love of God. So that's what it's talking about with the world. So what does it mean? Well, when the Bible says, do not love the world, or to stop loving the world, First of all, it means that you do these things, that you do. You have a, a gravitation of your heart to fall in love with things that we shouldn't or dedicate things or hold them on such a high priority that they're the most important things. And so, first of all, you have to realize that this is something that we do. And the second thing is that you can stop it. The scripture says you can stop it. You don't have to love the world. You don't have to be so attached to anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It does not have to be the all in all what it is to be alive for you because that's what it is to love the world and the things that are in the world. And if you do so, the love of the Father is not in you. So I do this thing and I realize that I shouldn't be doing this thing and I can stop it. Number two, this unconditional love means that it's reserved for God alone. If we're told not to love the world or the things that are in the world, it's because God himself is supposed to fill that place. There are people in... in low-income areas in other countries that have virtually nothing, where there are 12 people that sleep in a small room, and they have one set of clothing, and they don't know where they're going to get food from, and you know what? They have joy. They have joy because they know the Lord Jesus Christ, because God fills that place. Why is it that we as Americans find it so hard to have real joy? We have a complaining problem, a gossip problem, and all the other things. It's because the stuff, the love of this world gets a hold of us. And suddenly we think our stuff is the source of our joy. So if we don't have our stuff or if I can't go out to eat or I can't go to Target or I can't go to, uh, uh, you know, Marshalls and spend or if I can't go online and spend money, somehow I have no joy in my life. Well, joy is not supposed to be coming from the things, the experiences of our life. Certainly it's enjoyable and it says in the scriptures God has put all these things into our lives for us to enjoy. But when it is the, the source of joy, when it is the, the mainline way of you finding significance and importance and security, then you will be sadly disappointed. That's why it says stop loving the world and the things that are in the world. So recognizing the, uh, the current of this life has an effect on our allegiance to God. Realize that everything that the TV tells you, the radio tells you, that the people at work tell you, that... The, everything that you see is trying to, to force you down a particular path and realize that that is the current of this world system. When you realize that, it te you tend to be on guard and you, know, you don't innocently just go on the internet and just go surfing and thinking that uh, everything's okay because you're going to go with the flow and suddenly you're going to find something that's attractive to your eye or to your flesh or the pride of your life and you're going to be lured away and enticed. So, Understanding these things, I think, is important. So the scripture says, do not love the world or the things that are in the world, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Well, we're going to get into what that means. The love of the Father comes with a non-compete clause. 
a non-compete clause, sometimes when you work at a place, especially if you do sales, they make you sign a non-compete clause, which means if you're going to open up your own business or work for a competitor, you have to do it within a certain period of time, and uh, you have to do it a certain amount of miles away. It's called a non-compete clause. But what, what God says is, listen, he's not going to compete for our affections. Either the love of the Father is in you or the love of the world is in you. It's, it's a choice, and it's not like you can have both. You can either serve God or you can serve money, and that's it. That's the way Jesus put it. So we have an option. What is the most important thing in your life? What is the thing that you can't do without? It should be your relationship with God. It should be the relationship that Jesus Christ has ushered in for us. If it's not, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to find prayer very difficult. You're going to find reading the scripture incredibly boring. You're going to find even fellowship chafing and, and so hard to put up with uh, people's little foibles. Because the love of the Father is not in you. If you don't have the love of the Father in you, you can't love other people. So these things of the world and the affections that we put on things and the priorities that we put them, it takes us away from fellowship with God. And he's not speaking to non-Christians here. He's talking to those of us who know and love the Lord God. So it certainly applies to me. And I realize I have to be on guard for the things of this world. I need to realize that I, I can stop it because it's something that happens. I gain an affection towards things. And you have to be careful what you put in front of your face or what you put in your ears and where you put yourself because you'll be put in positions of temptation. So it is a great detriment to our intimacy with God, our affections of this world. And we have to realize that they're in direct opposition to having fellowship with God. The scripture speaks of it elsewhere also in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world. It means to be pressed into the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way we do that is that we think different thoughts, we see different things, we listen to different things, we set our affections on things above that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Which tells me sometimes I don't understand what God's will is and I can get off center if my heart has an affection for the things of this world. I'm not going to be able to know what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is if I have affections in my heart for the things of this world because they will cloud out and they will push out the love of the Father. And so... There's a non God doesn't want to share his prominence with anything in our lives, and nor should he. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. The scripture is very clear. If we are going to be earth dwellers. We're going to be centered here and our affections are here and we're going to claim this as our home, then heaven isn't your home. Or if you claim heaven is your home, this could never be your home. You'll always be an alien. You'll always be a stranger. You'll always be wandering through on a temporary basis through this world. That's just who we are. And, you know, this body that God's given to us is just a space suit to take up space in this space. At some point, he's going to take us home. And that will be our true home. So don't get too anchored. Don't get too hung up here because you make yourself an enemy of God because God will then work on you to release that affection because he loves you. And he knows that that thing will ultimately destroy you. It's like taking home a, a, a baby uh, lion. You're going to raise it, you're going to feed it, and it's going to be bigger than you. And eventually you will be feeding it with you. And that's just the nature of what happens when you allow the world to come in and you allow it to capture your affections. So I don't want God to have to compete with the affections of the things of this world. And it's, when we think of it that way, it seems reprehensible, but that's truly what happens. So this is clearly idolatry. And I know uh, if you're like me, you think idolatry is, well, I, I think about people other who, who make you know, giant statues and bow down and worship them. That's what idolatry is. But idolatry is anything that you put in the place of God an affection or a priority that is not him that has taken his prominence away. Or if you shuffle things around, like if your job's more important than your family, that's called idolatry because your family should be more important. So those are things that we do commonly, and it's very clearly idolatry. If you remember Exodus chapter 20, the scripture tells us, if you remember the Ten Commandments, 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Some people put a period there and stop, and they say, okay, so make no images. I don't have pictures. I don't let people take a picture of me. Uh, I, I don't carve things. I don't draw pictures because they're wrong. Uh, well, you have to read the rest of it. It says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. That's the continuance of that sentence. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations, to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's clearly idolatry when there is something of this earth that takes a priority over our relationship with God. And it can be any number of things. It's very clearly idolatry. And it's interesting how silly it is when you think of it that something so unimportant can become the most important thing in your life. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is at the Areopagus in Greece, and he's giving a sermon. And he's speaking to these idol worshipers, and they have idols everywhere. And they've got all kinds of names on them. And he runs across one that says, to the unknown God, because they didn't want to leave anyone out. You know, so they made an image to the unknown God. And Paul picks up on this and he says, I'd like to tell you about the God that you made a statue of. You're very religious people. <laughs> what I'd like to do is tell you about the unknown God that this statue is dedicated to. And he picks that up and he explains. And he talks a little bit about idolatry and God's point of view about it. And he says it here in verse 24 of chapter 17. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all to all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him... We live and move and have our being, as some of your own prophets have said, your poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, so ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And of course, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ becoming our judge. He says, you know, God's let this go on way too long but now he has demonstrated that this isn't acceptable. In chapter 44 of Isaiah, it talks about idolatry and how silly it is, that you take a tree that you planted and that you watched grow up and you cut it down and you cut it into pieces and part of it you throw on the fire and you make bread with and, and you warm yourself with and the other one you carve into an image and you bow down and worship it out of the same piece of wood. And it is silly. And, you know, I think about how crazy it is for somebody who's in drug addiction, which I come out of, that they will do anything for the next fix. They'll, they'll, they'll rob their best friends. They will steal things. They will, they will kill people. I mean, they'll do anything just to get that next feeling. And that's an extreme version of what this is talking about, loving the world and putting something in a much higher priority than it's to be. And it's because people seek to fill that empty void that only God can fill. And once he fills it, everything else is inconsequential. It's just not that important. But what can happen is we set our affections on those things and they become very, very important. And we found ourselves in the middle of idolatry. So, for all that is in the world, and he defines what that is. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And there are a couple of other times when the scripture mentions this. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3. If you remember when the devil came to tempt Eve with this fruit, it says that so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so there's the, the lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, 
that it appealed to her, her looking, her, her eyes, the eye gate. And number three, it was desirable to make one wise that it contributed to her life and the pride of her life. She took and she ate the fruit she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So the scripture's clear that these seem to be the three plays of the devil. He'll either apply to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, or what it is that you can have or possess or that's yours. He does this again in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, in the temptation of Jesus. You might remember, he tempts him in a, he goes, he takes him to the temple in a high place and says, jump down from here because the angels will catch you. Uh, so that's certainly the, the, the lust of the eyes. For Jesus to throw himself down and the angels would catch him and send him back down, it, it's in a very public place where everyone would see and he would be declared who he truly was, the son of God. And that would have been really, really good for him, right? Uh, he was hungry. He didn't eat. He was fasting for 40 days. And the devil said, take these stones. If you're really the son of God, take these, son, these stones and make them into bread. And then you can eat. And he, and he refused to do that because it was more important for him to do the will of God than it was to obey his body. And it was more important that he do what is right before his heavenly father than to be seen by others to be the Christ. And then, of course, uh, the third one was the devil showed him in a, in, in a way of looking at all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, I'll give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. And that would be the pride of life. So you can see throughout the scripture, there are these three plays. It's, it's either through what you see, it's what you're feeling in your emotions and in your body, or this sense of uh, a mental ascent of I possess this thing or I'm, I'm better because I have this thing. And it can be all sorts of things. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. The lust of the flesh. It is the lust of your flesh. It is literally carne. It is, it is your body. It is the, the, the desires that you have within you. And it's, uh, there's, the, there's suspect number one. It's the desire of the body or your human nature. If you want to be thought well of, which is a desire of a lot of people, and they put that on a very high pedestal, and so they do things that are false and even against things that they understand because they want other people to like them. They dress in a certain way that other people will like them. Uh, they don't even know who they are because they're so busy trying to morph and chameleon into what other people want them to be that they don't know who they are. And so it, it, it's just one instance of how it is to, to take something and to make it an idol and make it a, of the flesh. It's our work. If you know, God called us to work. It's one of the first things he actually called Adam to do. He said, I want you to work. I put you here to keep the ground and, and make sure it's, it's well and it's preserved. So it's something that's good, but taken to an excess, it's an idol. Food, which was given by God for us to eat. It's wonderful. I love food, obviously. Obviously. So food is a wonderful thing, but taken to an extreme, we can become morbidly obese and we can die prematurely as fools because food is too important. Think about sex. Sex is something that God created and that God gave for a husband and a wife, for one man and one woman to experience. It's not something to just be thrown away or given or to be taken. And what happens when you... When you do that to that excess or outside the bounds of marriage, God says that that is idolatry. You're taking something and you're serving it as a God. Pleasure, which certainly pleasure is fine, but to an excess, it's idolatry. Leisure, you know, we need rest. In fact, God built into the week one out of seven to rest. Rest and leisure is not a problem with him. But the problem is when that is the end of your life is I want everything easy for me and we become spoiled brats. Rest, love, even love. Love is a good thing, but in priority. You, I mean, I, I, when I was a young man, if a girlfriend broke up with me, I wanted to commit suicide. That, that's not any kind of love that God wants us to have. It's not to be that kind of a possessive, obsessive thing. So strength, uh, uh, certainly strength is good. I go to the gym, but you know, you can become a slave to the gym where I, I have to go running or I feel guilty about anything I put in my mouth and we can become obsessed about the physical. Uh, health, knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing to have, but you can't worship knowledge. If, if I have 15 degrees, does that mean that I have a right to tell you anything and I have a right to be arrogant? And That's usually what ends up happening. So knowledge can be something that you're a slave to. Money, obviously money is something that's chased after because it's a freedom to be able to do what you want to do when you feel like doing it. Uh, it it's certainly something that's necessary and God is not against those things, nor is he against private property. But what he does say is, 
It's, it has a place, and you can't serve God and money. You can't put money in the place of God. So even challenge uh, people that are adrenaline junkies, people that like to go on vacation, people that like new and different things in their life, you can become addicted to that, where you're not happy unless you're doing something new or something challenging, or you're not you know, jumping off a, a, a cliff with a parachute and you know, near-death experience. Anything can become an addiction, obviously. Drugs, alcohol, all of those things become such an issue, and those are idols. When they're the most important thing and you can't let go of it and it's, it's something that is highest priority in your life, it's an idol. Even excellence, doing things well and doing things right is, is wonderful, but you can become obsessed with it to become a perfectionist. And you're never happy with anything because not anything is ever perfect. Not your physicality, not anything. Uh, security, I, I want to feel secure. I want to have enough money in the bank. How much do you need? Oh, just, just a little more it becomes an idol. Or importance. I'm important because I have a degree or because of who I'm related to or because of the things that I do or because of these things I've accomplished or because of what other people say about me. All of that can become an idol and it's the thing that we live for instead of I do what the Lord wants me to do and I please him and that's why I do those things. You see, it's all about motivation. It's all about doing the right thing for the right reason. So we can get very confused about all of these things. James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15 says this. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives forth death. That is the process. It all begins with the desire it starts with a want, and it either comes through the eye, it comes through your physical um, uh, yearnings, or it comes through the pride of life or accomplishment, uh, accomplishment of what you have. So this is the anatomy of how it happens. It starts with a desire. So be careful what you set your eye on. Be careful what you set your heart on. Be careful of your appetites. Uh, it's always a problem to go food shopping when you're hungry because you already have a desire to eat everything, so you just fill up the cart and... You know, I'll just put it on credit and it's okay. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, that's idolatry. So we can't live that way. So the lust of the eyes, it's what we see. When we put some, our eyes upon something and we find it attractive, uh, it, it, we have words that are very much uh, in that category like envy or coveting or jealousy. We, we look at things like that, and that's how it, those are the feelings that it generates when we look at them. And we can look at fine things and beautiful things and say, that's a, that's a wonderful thing, or, or, uh, or a person. Jesus says, if you look at a woman and you desire her, it says it's as though you've committed adultery with her. It's, as far as God's concerned, it's the same thing. So we have to be careful what we put before our eyes. And certainly there, there are lots of things that you can see that you can enjoy and you can like, but when they become the most important thing and you can't do without them, and especially in a time like this, uh, we're all locked down at home and there are a lot of things that we can't do, it begins to really test me to see, you know, how important do you think these things are when we go out and we have, you know, all of these things that we spend money on that are just not necessary. Entertainment has become huge and it can become an idol, just like anything else. So that's the I. So what do we do when you don't receive the thing you're looking for. I don't know about you, but when I see something and I want it and I don't get it, uh, it does something. And there, there are all sorts of reactions. Anger is one of them. Uh, I, I really want this thing, but I don't. Or I uh, wake up and I haven't been sleeping all night and I realize I have to get up and my alarm's gone off. You know, there, when you don't get the things that you want, whether it comes in any of those ways, you have a reaction. You know, sometimes it can just be, ah, I can't believe it. Uh, and it doesn't matter what it is. It could be coming to work and discovering that uh, somebody decided to ransack the aisles of the place that you work. Or it could be that you went on vacation for a week and you ended up going to the beach and there's no sun. It's just completely rainy an entire week. So what do you do when you don't get the things that you want or the things that you imagine or the things that you see? Uh, there are so many different ways that we can react. Or, you know, I'm late to work and I get in traffic. What do you do with that when you want something but you can't have it? What it'll do is it'll kill you. I mean, it'll kill you interior. So you'll either get angry or you get depressed or you get any... But it all starts with a desire that's unfulfilled. It's when your heart desires something that doesn't happen, it makes you sick. So 
don't set your heart on the, thing of the things of this world. And if, if you have an issue with any of those things, it might be that you've set your heart on something that you shouldn't. So, it says in Revelation 18, 14, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. There is coming a time in this world when the Lord comes back to take us home. And when he does that, there'll be no more anything. And when we're out of here and the world is left here, things will diminish so much more than what we're experiencing now with the COVID-19. We're talking about not having an availability to even some of the basic necessities of life. When that occurs, people will realize that their hearts have been in love with stuff and the stuff will betray them. Like uh, an unfaithful lover, they will leave them in a heartbeat and not think twice about them. So that's what's a bad love. The lust of the eyes. It all begins with believing the lie that you should receive all that you desire. There are people who are spoiled and they believe they should get everything that they want. They believe that they, well, not everything I want, but just this one thing. Whatever it is, that's a heart that's not yielded to the lordship of Jesus Christ and to the Lord God himself. What we should say is if the Lord is willing, then this will be or that will be. But it's, it's believing the lie that I deserve this thing that was what kills us. And it starts with the desire. So we have to maintain our hearts because it is the wellspring of life, the scripture says. In James chapter, one, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, it says, where do wars and fights come from among you? In other words, why, why are people struggling with each other? Here's the secret. They, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? For instance, you lust and you don't have. So you murder, you covet, you cannot obtain, you fight and you war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see, the Lord says that our hearts get set on a certain desire and we do anything to try to get it because of our desires. If you don't maintain your heart and if you don't understand that the lust of your flesh and the lust of your eyes are running you and ruling you because the TV will tell you this is what you have to have. You, this is not good enough. You have to have this. Every single commercial tries to appeal to some visceral urge in your flesh of one of these three things to get you to buy their product. Don't buy into it because you don't need it. It's a substitute, and the love of God is not going to be in your heart if you do. And the third one is the pride of life. There are all sorts of examples of what it is to have a pride of life. It's it's about being arrogant about the things that you have and what you possess that make you better somehow than someone else. That places you on a completely different level. So, And there's all sorts of ways that people do it. They can do it with money. They can do it with fame and fortune. Uh, there are lots of ways that they show people that they believe that they're above other people. And they demonstrate it by the way they look. If you remember the story of Scrooge, Scrooge thought he was above everyone because he had money. And he did his absolute best to make sure that he didn't let any of it out of his reach, uh, whether it be his employee or whether it be other people or whatever time of the season it is, he didn't care because the most important thing to him was his money. And I, we watch it every Christmas because I love the story. But Scrooge was one of these guys who made this thing his lover, and it was a lover that never loved him back. And it's always like that, the things of this world. So be careful of what you entertain. Sin fascinates before it assassinates. And that's what it'll always do, but it's always the capture of your heart first. So if you remember Wall Street, the movie, it, it basically Michael Douglas talks about how great greed is and about how America runs on greed and how important it is. But is greed really important? Is it really something that keeps our country alive? Uh, private enterprise was never meant for people to be greedy and self-centered. It was a way for them to be independent from the, the whims of other people, paying them zero dollars for a lot of work. It was rebellion against slavery. And so going to the, the level of greed is a completely different thing. And certainly God says that is the love of the world and the things that are in the world. So, and a word as to why you don't wanna do this, because this world is passing away and the lust of it. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The reason why loving this world and the things of this world is bad because it's going away and it's all degrading. In fact, 
If you look in the mirror, you'll notice that you yourself are degrading. I, don't, I, I look at movies and I see old movies and then I see what people look like today and I go, wow, look what time has done there. I look at myself and I look at old pictures of myself and I go, wow, I used to be young. <laughs> I used to look better than I look now. I think about those things, but if your affection is on the things of this world and if that's the most important thing, you'll, you'll end up depressed or suicidal. But if the Lord God is the one who meets your greatest needs, then all of those things are completely uh, able to be taken out of your hand because you hold it with an open hand. Everything in our life we hold with an open hand because it's not ours. It's his, and we have to return it to him. It says in 1 Corinthians 7.31, for this world in its present form is passing away. Everything. Now, this is a, actually a church building that was abandoned and left this way. And we can see that everything in this world is passing away. And it doesn't matter how grand or how much money you put into it or how wonderful it looks. Uh, this is a mansion in Italy. It's just left for dead. So if you're interested in some cheap real estate, uh, here's one here. It's a real fixer-upper. But this is what ends up happening in this world. Anything that we do, that when we put our heart and soul into something, I mean, someone built this place and they put their life into it, and now it's worthless. It's, it's a stack of garbage. Our lives can be that way if we place our affections on the things of this world. So here's, a, here's another place in Italy. It's a, it's a beautiful mansion. I mean, somebody took pride in this. Somebody was glad to welcome you in their front door and say, hey, welcome to my home. And it's a bit of a showy home. And it's designed to be that way so that people look and say, wow, you must be really important or really rich. And people think well of them. But this world is going away. And setting our hearts on the love of this world is something where you're, you're going to get jaded by this lover. Here's a place that's in the Ukraine. It's in Pripyat in the Ukraine, which is not very far from Chernobyl, where they had an accident. And there's ta whole towns that are abandoned. Thousands of people live and um, just completely gone and run down because the things of this world are going away at a high rate of speed. You want to make sure that you're not on that. And it doesn't matter how grand the architecture. Here's a place in Indiana. It's a Methodist church that's abandoned. And it's such a beautiful place. Boy, I wish it was here in North Middletown. But those things that we find important, whether they be facilities or vehicles or even human beings, they're not as important as our relationship with God. And we have to be careful not to have an inordinate affection for those things. So Romans 8, 12 to 14 tells us this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the scripture is pretty clear about telling us if we're going to live for the body, if we're going to live for the flesh, if we're going to live for the things of this world, we're going to die. And it's not, it's not the initial heart-stopping death that's really the biggest thing. It's the second death, which is our separation from God and an eternity separated from him in a place that the, the scriptures very clearly talk about, which is hell, which is an everlasting punishment. That is the death that you don't want. And unfortunately, this world is vying for your affection, and it will draw you away from the love of the Father. Our origin is what determines our destiny. If our origin, the origin of our motives, the origin of our desires, the origin of, of everything that we do is going to be of this world or of ourselves, then that is going to tell us where we're going to go and how we're going to spend eternity. If it comes from God, then we will enjoy eternal life. If it doesn't come from him, if it comes from this world, there's only one place it's all going to go, and it's all going to be gone. So... Uh, this is an interesting quote that I found uh, some time ago, and it reminds me of how to check the things that are coming into my life from the world and not to set my heart on it. It was made by Susanna Wesley in 1725 to her son, John, um, one of her two sons who were very popular and famous in the Christian world. She says, take this rule, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God or takes off your relish of spiritual things. In short, whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin for you, however innocent it may be in itself. It's kind of an interesting test when you have an innocent thing. 
uh, to buy a magazine. Seems like nothing. Is it something that's going to draw me closer to God or further from him? To watch something on YouTube, is it something that will make me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Is this something that is going to draw me away and, and kind of quench the fire that I have for my love for God? Or is it something that's going to increase that fire? So I use this as a, a tool. And even good things are the enemy of the best things. And we have to make those selections. So just, to, just as a way of review, this is our scripture for the day. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So I pray and hope that you will take encouragement from the scriptures and direction that if your heart is set on the affections of this world, it doesn't have to be. And the real fulfillment comes when we give our lives to God and say, I'm going to do anything you want me to do. I accept the gift of your son. I accept the gift of forgiveness that comes through him. And I pray that you strengthen me and help me to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.